Welcome back to the On the Table Gaming Podcast, and we are now at Visions in the Flames, episode 13. We'll be talking about House Stark and the changes coming to A Song of Ice and Fire in the 2021 update. Special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who make this podcast possible, and let's jump right into it. Without further ado, Fabio Curry, lead game developer, and Michael Chanal, game designer, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Hey, Chase. Always great to be here. I'm eager to talk about the, the, the paintings that we, we saw for the Free Folk. Oh, yeah. All right. There we go. We'll, we'll jump right in with the, the Free Folk talk then. So thank you so much to everyone who submitted their images for that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to start off right here. This one caught my eye was uh, someone calling out Bones and they posted Rattle Shirt. Ooh, that, that was a low blow, low blow. Now, Tim Taylor, that's an amazingly painted Rattle Shirt. But, uh, you know, our, our channel's history with some of these characters that are adorned in bones. So I don't know about that. Oh, what's one that caught your eye, Fabio? Um, well, I'm going to say two. Uh, I was actually really impressed by Mike Meeple's work, as usual, to be honest. And I'm also going with Martin Adenbring Monson. I hope I'm saying that right. With his Craster miniature. Um, in Mike Meeple, I'm really impressed with the overall composition as well as the the snow. I like the snow texture. I know it's just putting the thing there, but it's really nice. <laughs> and um, in Martin's case, although he did not base his miniature, which is a negative for me, I'd say that the, the lighting is really good, right? You can actually see things that would... I'm not even sure if this is the flash, but I think not, right? Like on his knees. And look at the wood, like you can see on the back of the chair, like the little highlights, like that's crazy. He highlighted the knots. Yeah, that's a lot of hard work, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Michael, how about you? I'm going to go with Nick Way and his absolutely just massive army that he posted up here, uh, mainly because I like a lot of the uh, the bases on here as well. You know, the miniature painting is very good, but I'm always a stickler for bases because I think that's where you can get a lot of creativity out there, such as like on his... um you know, rattle shirt base where there's just a couple of giant skulls on the base. Actually, there's a couple of skulls on most of his bases here, but it's still really nice. Now, he <laughs> needs to get those movement trays done up, and then we'll have a complete looking force here. Granted, he might be one of those people that prefers not to. I used to be one of those as well. Still, nice little just giant horde of guys here. That's been using all his time painting up that entire force there because that is a lot of miniatures. He's almost got a solid 20 points of free folk there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but unfortunately, we're not talking about free folk today. We're actually going to be talking about how Stark. There's a lot of a lot of ground to cover here, some really interesting things that you revealed. And uh, Fabio, we're going to have to be on our best behavior because... Uh, there's, this is a territory that's rife for making like wolf or dog puns. So we'll, we'll have to, you know, we'll keep it to a, a minimum, uh, Michael, yeah. so that it's, it's not too bad. I'll quit my barking then. Oh, <laughs> but if we did make more puns, Fabio, right? It'd be hilarious. <laughs> no, oh, that's... is that why he's howling, Reed? <laughs> <laughs> or, all right, I feel if we keep doing this, Michael, will be worse <laughs> for wear. <laughs> Sorry, let's, let's <laughs> All right. Um. You know, it's quite impressive that you guys have both managed to hit strikes two of three <laughs> in such rapid succession. It's pretty okay. impressive. Uh, so let's uh, let me bring it back here. And uh, so we're talking about House Stark right now. This is a faction that was in the original design of the game, right? You did Lannisters and Starks. So maybe big picture before we even get into this 2021 update. Let's go way back, and, and how did the concept of House Stark maybe shift since its original inception in the Alpha to, to what we're seeing now, and kind of it being furthermore redefined or really kind of polished? So you want to I'm... see how the Alpha Wolves changed? Oh, oh my gosh, all right. Well, we're done here. We'll see you next week. <laughs> all right, so we're back again here. And uh, Michael, so uh, talking about the concept, the concept of House Stark, how it's shifted since its original inception, where the, you know, Starks are, you kind of have this in the books, this idea of honor and commitment, uh, you know, duty, uh, and of course, aggression, you know, has that always been the case? And, you know, have mechanics, you know, were there other mechanics you tried out and, you know, to get to where they are today? Uh, honestly, Starks from their initial conception have kind of maintained the same. They were the first art pieces, the very first faction that was, you know, developed and designed, you know, they're, they're the ones that started it all. I remember actually, if you ask me about the biggest change that happened to them, was actually from the visual aesthetics. When we had initially made them 
uh, they had much more of a kind of uh, heavy pelt Viking kind of look to them. And then we got the feedback from George Martin that went, oh, well, Winterfell, unlike what its name suggests, is actually more like a fall atmosphere most of the year. So if they were wearing these heavy furs here, they would die of heat stroke. <laughs> oh, uh, interesting. So what mainly happened was a lar large amount of the initial start concepts got stripped down into a lighter clothing was the thing that I remember most about the early stages of that faction where, you know, again, you had these kind of big burly, you know, Viking looking guys in like just heavy, heavy looking winter pelts and everything. And then they got stripped down into their current version where they're wearing kind of like, you know, fallish chainmail, I guess, if you want to go that designer boutique look. And, you know, at the same time, these, these, uh, the ideals of the Starks have, have stayed the same and uh, really coming across as like aggression being like their number one thing. And even now in the 2020 update, yeah, sure things have changed, but it's still very much recognizable that these are the core central elements of House Stark. So I'm excited today to kind of talk about, you know, how we're seeing the Stark identity further re redefined in the Tactus cards, and then in some of the kind of tweaks that are being made and improvements to some of the units and attachments. So let's let's start in with the Tactics deck, because I think we've talked about in the past how the tactics deck really kind of encapsulates the the full range of expression for what a faction is, right? If you look over the tactics deck, you get a kind of an idea of how does this group play. Um, so, when approaching the tactics decks as a whole, what was kind of the overall idea that you wanted to convey with their deck? Uh, if you look at like the initial concepts of the deck, you can see like you know they have their focus on aggression, they have their focus on mobility, they also have their focus that they gain bonuses when they're almost destroyed, like down to their their last ranks and those type of effects. And you can see this via the generic tactic cards such as Dire Wolf's Fervor, uh, Northern Ferocity, and then I guess a little bit in the North Remembers. But all of these kind of effects are meant to play like, you know, they gain bonuses the worse off there are. You know, mm -hmm. when you've got that wolf backed up against the wall, it's going to become much more ferocious. And so that, in combination with their themes of aggression and the mobility that they had as a faction, that is what the focus of, you know, their update was to really push them more in that direction. Overall, you know, I'd say the Starks, they had a refinement. You know, previously when we spoke about other factions, how some of the tactics could have like radically shifted around in some cases to, you know, meet the goals we want. With the Starks, there wasn't so much of like any radical shifts here. It was more so just things were already in the direction we wanted them to go. It was just pushing them further in those directions. And then doing the general consensus of things that we talked about, the 2021 updates, such as removing the you know amount of free actions, removing the raw amount of just like bonus dice and things. So instead, you have effects that are going to be bonuses that are going to make your damage more reliable instead of just upping the amount of damage potential that you have. And on top of that, um, since the Starks were one of the early factions, or they were the OG <laughs> faction, like people say, I think that at the time when, when we made the tactics cards, we... Um, you can see that usually the older tactics cards are slightly more powerful than the newer ones because as we evolved, uh, as the game evolved, we kind of got the knack of doing tactics cards. So uh, all the star cards seem super powerful, right, in, in, in their current form. And that needed to change in a way where it was more modulated to the other factions and the power level of the other tactics decks. So, uh, admittedly, the Stark Tactics deck was a little bit above the curve, but once again, like, it, it didn't need to be redesigned, it just needed to be modulated in accordance to all the other cards. Sorry, I actually feel that in the case of the Stark Tactics deck, it wasn't so much a case that the cards were all just, well, actually that's not true. There's a lot of cases in the deck where they are just very strong cards. Uh, Swift Advance, Sudden Charge, come to mind immediately. Mm -hmm. But more so, it is the accessibility in which they can be played combined with that fact, where you're gaining some substantial benefits for very little tactical investment. Because you have, like, Winter is Coming, Northern Frosty. These are cards that are very easy to trigger and give you a fairly substantial benefit. You have cards like Swift uh, actually Swift Advance and Northern Frosty are probably going to be your two best examples here. You can just play them and gain a substantial benefit. Sudden Charge is another one that at least that one requires a little bit of setup where you at least have to claim a zone, but it's still a very open, it's still a very open trigger for the effect you're getting. So that was that combines with the fact that like the effects are strong. I would argue that some of the other tactics decks had just as strong, if not stronger, effects individually, but the ability to play these cards and just have them just work with very minimal effort. I think that was the key strength of these Stark decks. 
and kind of the uh, source of its kind of overtunement in compared to some of the other decks. And I think a lot of these cards we're seeing, um, they maybe aren't exactly repeating what they were before, but they kind of rhyme, right? They're similar enough. I, I think earlier you just said uh, Swift Advance, when we're talking about Swift Reposition, it's going to be one of those, like, it's a small change. Um, it's going to take me a while to, to remember as well. You know, still really impactful, right? Maneuvering and free movement has changed in this version, but however, the value of movement is still there. And so if it's a little bit less distance that you're moving, those small inches, those still really, those really add up and that's really significant. So under this new system, like a shift can be a you know, make or break thing, right? If you know when to play that. And of course, uh, you can't do things like shift out of combat, right? So you got to know when to play them. Right. The whole point of like tactics cards comes down. These should be play and strategy enhancers. They shouldn't be defining, you know, plays on their own. So the example that you're giving here with the swift reposition versus swift advance, the previous, you know, swift advance, that allowed you to basically with minimal effort set up a uh a set yourself into a position to capitalize on a situation that your opponent really had no control over because you just okay all of a sudden this thing is now moved five to six inches up the field and is now going to take its full activation that was not really something i had to plan to do i just played a card i got the effect swift reposition because the bonus is uh, cut back because it is a shift instead of a full maneuver unless you set up other conditions for it, then it helps to enhance a plan. So this is going to give you that extra two inches that you might need, maybe get you into a better like line of sight arc or get to a flank with the shifting, but it's not going to be a playmaker on its own unless you go to the extra effort of potentially setting up with like the maneuver zone to give you a full three inch maneuver. So the effect here is that these the tactics cards enhance strategies. They don't necessarily define them. That makes sense. And then, you know, in case someone's just tuning in for the first time, Fabio, maybe could you speak to the North Remembers, right? Now, this card used to be when a friendly unit is destroyed. Now it's the start of any turn. So we've seen these sort of changes across all the faction decks, but just in case someone is tuning in for the first time, you know, how does this maybe represent the philosophy of the 2021 update? I do believe that this is a good thing to go through again. <laughs> um, you are right. Basically, before this was when a friendly unit was destroyed, and that meant that you either had a dead card in the beginning of the game, um, which you had to throw away, or you had to hold it uh, for specific situations. So it, it was a tricky card to use with tricky timing. So changing it to start of any turn means that you'll always use this card, um, basically, right? And, and then your opponent will actually see where you're placing it. So that gives him some sort of counterplay where at least the information is open to him as well. And basically, after you, you play this card at the start of any turn, you attach it to a unit. And then afterwards, while attached, when a unit dies, you place an order token on this card and activate its ability for the rest of the game. So I think, once again, this goes into quality of life. And it was a great solution to remove most of the when a unit is destroyed triggers which were difficult to use and um, really had a great design intent, but not weren't really well executed, I'd say. And so there's not going to be as many like cards that you want to pitch necessarily just because you know, like, oh, this isn't going to come up for a while. Like there's kind of a use to almost every card then. Pitching cards now is a, um, a tactical choice that players need to stop and think about um, because like, I hope there are no more dead cards uh, unless in like very specific situations, but then the player has to give up some sort of value because it might not be the best card for him, but it still will do something. So if he's pitching the card, he is losing value in, in his deck in a way. So once again, it goes back to making the choices matter. Like every single choice should have an impact and should have consequences for better or worse. Does that translate over to other elements of the cards as well? So I was trying to go through and just keep track of as cards that maybe have been changed or updated or have like a spiritual successor, like, you know, Assault Orders is kind of the successor to, to Sudden Charge. Uh, it's still zone replacement, but it's no longer focused on the maneuver zone. It's now focused on the uh, the attack zone. You still have the same number of, zone, of cards that rely on the maneuver zone. So like the faction identity stays the same, uh, but kind of in, in in spreading out the the tactic zones that you're trying to control on certain cards. Do you kind of see any reprioritization of tactic zones value? Um, like when you think about the tactics board, do you think of each zone having like a base value that's comparable to other zones on the board? 
or do you think of the value of the taxes board more tied to the circumstances that arise in the game? Okay, so I believe that um, in a bubble, all tactic zones have the same value and worth. Of course, when you look and you say, oh, free attack, this is obviously better. Not necessarily, right? Um, And anyone who's played more than two games can tell you (laughs) that uh, the tactics zones are generally equivalent. Part of the faction design for for each faction is what zones they favor more. Mm -hmm. And, And that really shifts how players play. Right. If if me and you are not competing for these kicker effects because we don't have uh, the same kicker zones, you know, and and benefits, uh, I still might want to take your zones because um, it's it's reducing your overall your, your net power, right? Because if you're right. I'm playing against right. Lannisters and I take the crown, so um, the Starks they work off maneuver and combat zones, but. Uh, and usually factions that work off of the combat zone, I'd say, have a small advantage because you can just double down on aggression. But once again, since the maneuver zone is actually one of the zones that is most prevalent in tactics cards across all factions, that also kind of compensates for the Starks because they're they're always going to be competing for maneuver Um with a few exceptions, right? But if they're playing against Free Folk, if they're playing against Targaryens, that maneuver zone gets very up in stock, right? Everyone needs it. So I'm not sure I answered your question, (laughs) but I hope that was entertaining. Yeah, no, I think that uh, illuminates some of the thoughts behind how you maybe think about the taxes board and kind of design around it. Well, let's jump into these combat units. So let's just start off with the two generic infantry units. We've got our House Umbra Great Axes, and uh, you know we're seeing them get a, an increase in movement, kind of maybe speaking to that Stark maneuverability. And then Executioner's Fury now is Sundering, and enemies suffer plus one wound from failing panic tests caused by this attack for each of this unit's destroyed rank. So as it takes more damage, it's going to actually be doing more damage to the opponent. And this unit also has Unyielding, and we saw Unyielding show up when you previously revealed the Berserkers. So how does this unit kind of encapsulate the Stark identity? And then um, what role do you see this playing on the battlefield? Has it shifted from the previous version? Okay, so Unyielding is not necessarily um, unique to uh, the Umber House, and it doesn't mean that all Umber units are going to necessarily have Unyielding, Um, but it, it does fit their theme. But I'd say that the I'm going to actually address the Umber Berserkers first, where now they're a unit that is made to maul um, um, hordes of enemies, and they get a lot of attack dice through. The uh, Umber Great Axes now serve the position of the Armor Piercers, right, where they want to go for high-value targets. And they're although they're seven points, they're actually one of the units that can really punched above their point class, right? And they can go for these elite tanky units. So I'd say they're like the Baratheon Banes. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's their role in the army. And kind of to do that properly, and given their four plus armor save, it didn't really uh, justify them having the, the low movement speed. So now with five movement speed and a very solid attack profile, um, they they fit that role. They're also, their damage does have a form of sustain in the fact that uh, as they take damage, their attack die profile does go down, but their panic damage goes up. So they just kind of trade and shift priorities here on what they actually focus on. So, you know, you have a unit that has Sundering, seven dice goes down to six dice, goes down to four dice, all of it hitting on a three plus. But at that last rank, they are only rolling four dice, but they're dealing plus two wounds from every failed panic test that they cause, and then they have unyielding, giving them a minus two to any of their panic tests that they call, that they fail. So they have a decent amount of sustain. You stick an attachment like a number of champion in these guys that gives them roll their highest attack value die and vicious. Then at one rank, these guys are throwing seven dice with sundering, hitting off three plus, and vicious, and then dealing two extra wounds from a failed panic test. Yeah, I mean, they look fantastic. Man, I always really like the House Umber Great Axes, like just the sculpt as well. So it's cool to see them have this role in the battlefield and that resilience, that kind of like Umber theme of like unyielding 
carrying through is going to make them like surprisingly tanky. And just on top of all that, I'd also like to say that Sundering here actually is really well valued in this unit because um, even when you're rolling less dice, it means that Sundering is actually going to help you push that one wound that you need from your attack to trigger the panic damage, right? Yeah. I mean, this unit here is meant to go after your high you know, priority targets, you know, your high defense targets. If you want to kill like some chafe units, like, you know, some free folk who just drop like flies, you send something like Umber Berserkers after them who just are going to throw a, you know, a ton yeah. of attack dice up there. Terrifying. You know, like, like Umber Berserkers, for example, are the opposite here, where at a single rank, they're throwing nine attack dice hitting on twos. Yeah, they don't have any special abilities linked to their attack, but... That's still nine dice hitting on twos. You're hitting something with a four plus or a five plus save. That's the point of what they go after. They Listen, shouldn't be engaged with things that are, you know, heavy defense. That's what you have your great axes for. Listen, we've all been there as free folk players where you there's that one tray of Umber Berserkers with just one dude left in it. And you're like, oh no, <laughs> like, get him away from us. <laughs> That guy's out there. Uh, but let's talk about core units here. So the Stark Sworn Swords. Now this is like the bread and butter of the Stark faction here. So now we see a change to Stark Fury. Now they gain Critical Blow and Sundering. And after they complete this attack, rather than suffering D3 wounds like in the past, they suffer two wounds minus one wound for each of its destroyed rank. So that kind of wounds with the wound reduction we're seeing show up in other areas in the faction. Is that kind of the core mechanic of uh, the Starks? Well, let's actually look at like what happened to Sworn Swords. Note that before it was a D3 wounds, that they wouldn't suffer if they were only at one rank. So that has been traded off for the flat two wounds, minus one wound for each destroyed ranks, which at turn at zero, sorry, one rank, means they're suffering zero wounds. But now there's a cost to pay for it, but that's the trade off here because this effect is very powerful. It's giving a five-point unit two key attack abilities of Sundering and Critical Blow. Noting here that this is a replacement from what they had previously, which was a Critical Blow and plus one to hit. The value of a plus one to hit, you know, there, that still exists in many other places in the faction, uh, more so in the form of like actual attack rerolls rather than just flat plus ones. The Sworn Sword Captain, for example, has martial training, which we've already spoiled before its new version, which is gives you rerolls and makes the defender vulnerable. Also, by the way, going back to previously what we talked about, the House Umber Great Axes, actually both Umber versions can make very good use of the uh, of the Sworn Sword Captain, just depending on what you want the role of that unit to be. With the Great Axes, you can make it turbo punch through armor, or you can give it a number champion to go on the vicious and morale play. With the Berserkers, you know, you can definitely put a Sworn Sword Captain there to give them vulnerable and rerolls, which you don't technically need because they hit on twos. So again, like it's whatever you want to build it out. But sorry, let's get back to talking about the Sworn Swords. Here, you have two very powerful effects of Critical Blow and Sundering. Sundering being able to punch through you know, your defense for a five-point unit, giving these guys the ability to swing up. You have Critical Blow, which um, is one of those effects that, depending on what you're sticking with them or the situation, can exponentially cause their damage to increase. I mean, you know, the odds of rolling seven sixes on your attacks is incredibly marginal, but it's still a potential there. So it still helps them out there. But these guys really embody, like, this is a solid five-point unit. It is an activation at five points. And then you have your room to expand it as you want with a one or two point attachment to, to see what it's going to bring to, you know, the rest of the unit here and customize them out, you know, to serve a role in the battle. And the decrease in attack profile is kind of in line with all the changes in the 2021 update. So going from, you know, 876 to 754 is kind of, you know, making it more baseline with, with everybody else. Yeah, I think we've shown enough uh, of the numbers changes on attack profiles where people aren't shocked anymore. <laughs> I've seen some of the reactions and uh, it's not like, oh, they ruined my unit. In, in general, people are like, OK, this is the new value for for a basic attack and the reception has been pretty positive i think people understood the necessity for these number changes and it really did better the quality of life of the game and let's talk about the young wolf rob stark with his attachment starting off there maybe we could talk a little bit about his uh, companion or potential companion before jumping into his commander version and his tactics cards so uh rob stark now he's dropping down to two points and he's got Swift Retreat. He can make a retreat action after he gets attacked with enhanced mobility, getting plus one to his movement, as well as being able to pivot before marching. So still all about the positioning. But, you know, instead of having Rapid Assault, we have an ability that's tied to an order. Uh, any thought into addressing, you know, the idea behind having less like always on abilities and having more order abilities? Well, um, order abilities 
I wouldn't say this as just a rule of thumb, but they usually uh, increase the amount of tactical decisions a player has to make. When something is just flat, um, they don't really have to think when it's in order. Even if they have to think minimally, they still have to. And that's something we want to push for uh, in increasing all these elements that need decision making. Because once they pile up, it really makes the game a lot deeper. And then probably the big discussion then is about Dire Wolves in 2021. It seems that Rob Stark's points values have decreased here to to kind of make room for an additive value in purchasing the Dire Wolves as a separate entity. So Michael, can you speak to us maybe about what does this change with Greywin kind of mean for the game or for House Stark, but then also for maybe all the Dire Wolves that are in the game? and how they kind of fit into the 2021 system. Well, so in the initial design of Starks, you know, wolves were a supplemental piece that were to be brought along for free with their, uh, and their point cost built into their attachments. And that was their initial role, was like a supplemental piece, you know, to factor in when taking a character. Over the time of the releases, the faction identity kind of began revolving around them, you know, for better or for worse, that's what people associate with Starks, is like, oh, they can take dire wolves. So what you had was initially a thing that was supposed to be a cool supplemental thing for taking a character became one of the focuses of the faction. As the meta and the game evolved, Dire Wolves filled into this role here where they were a cheap, free, uh, free and giant air quotes, activation and had a bunch of impacts that were not really their original like design idea because, you know, people use them as a free activation and then to stake objectives when they're really meant to be more of a support piece. And that was not really the direction we wanted them to take. I don't actually have a problem with people playing them like that. It's just that for the utility that they were bringing to the army versus their point cost, that was an unintended side effect. So when we were looking at, you know, redoing things and balancing things out for 2021, we had a couple directions that we could have taken with the dire wolves. One direction would have been to make them something akin to the skin changer bears with free folk, where they are a supplemental piece that is built into that unit. They don't provide the extra activation. They can't really act autonomously and they're tied to the character that they are linked to. That would have been a potential mechanical solution that would have put them into one category. But the thing is, that doesn't really flavorfully fit with how the Dire Wolves activate, because when they're on the battlefield, they're not linked to their companion in the same way that like a Skin Changer bear was. Like A bear is going to take to the battlefield because a Skin Changer is possessing it. Mm -hmm. A Dire Wolf is on the battlefield doing its own thing, and actually in most of the books and everything, the wolves are doing their own things when they're on the battlefield. Like when you know, Grey Wind is out there or Ghost is out there. Yeah, they're kind of hanging around their owners, but they're kind of off just doing their own thing. You know, there's not a lot of focus put on like the perspectives for them and everything. So we decided in this situation, instead of push them in that direction where they're so linked to their owner, we push them in the other direction to make them more autonomous to be their own thing. Uh, and again, this is going on the fact that as the faction is like in the game is developed, people like viewing them as like, this is a stark Thing. This is a thing that they have access to, so turning them in more, into more of a supplemental role would have reduced that, which, again, mechanically could have worked just fine, and that could have been a direction we took. But I feel that the community that plays Starks, that likes Dire Wolves, they like the idea of these wolves being a centerpiece to the army, which, again, I will fully admit was not one of the initial uh, directions that they were intended to take. They were, meant to be, they were always meant to be supplemental pieces. But... We acknowledge the fact that, you know, that when the game comes out and, you know, it evolved the way it did, what we initially wanted is not necessarily what happened. Like in the case here, people view Dire Wolves as like a core feature of the army. So instead of restricting that back, we just expanded on that and changed their role here. So now you have a unit that can act autonomously, that can do things on its own. Uh, and because of the way we've structured them with their point costs, we've distanced them further from the actual, like, uh, character that they're linked to. So Rob, by himself, is a good value to take, and you can take him, and you don't have to take Greywind. It's a bonus that you now unlock the ability to take Greywind. But Greywind should be adding tactical capabilities to your army. That should be a choice whether you want to include him or not, versus just, well, if Rob's in my army, I'm always going to have Greywind. Now it's at least an option here. Do I want to invest the points into this unit because of what it brings to my army? There are also a couple of other positive, let's say, side effects. I wouldn't say they were totally intentional, but in the end, they worked out for the best. The first one is that the Starks are now developing this uh, secondhand theme of getting characters to unlock others thing other things, right? We already had this with Arya, 
and and the wolves themselves but before with them being free they were just one blob like their character and the wolf now it's uh, like michael said you're unlocking the wolf and not only is that thematic in a way uh in in list building it also actually now doubled your list building options in regard to these these characters right because now you can choose to have them individually or or alongside their wolf um, or before you, they would always be with their wolf like now there is more decision making and usually when we say more decision making i'm all down for that and they got substantial kind of uh they got a little bit more beefy here right uh they doubled the number of tack dice gray one here although it went from two plus to three plus it's now four dice four plus armor morale is still great he's got sundering but really a uh, really key ability here disrupt enemies engage with this unit suffer negative one to hit and it turns out you know a, a giant direwolf running through your ranks is somewhat disruptive do you think that all direwolves will have similar abilities to like disrupt or is each direwolf maybe going to be its own thing the answer to that would be if they all did the same thing that would be monumentally lazy and also you know ignoring the fact that they actually all do have a distinct personality even if they are just wolves so each of the wolves carries a different tactical purpose on the battlefield Greywind uh, gives disrupt so he is kind of acting as your debuffer uh, shaggy dog is a focus on just kind of raw damage um, summer has you know, okay, I'm not going to spoil too much, but let's just say that he kind of pretty much is the one that received the smallest amount of changes based on how he previously functioned. So, you know, he has she. a lot of his interactions with she, sorry, Brandon Hodor, and Lady is still dead. So, oh, you know, that's the, uh, <laughs> oh that, oh man, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's kind of interesting to see here. Now, that's going to be really cool to see um, how this changes up list building too, because. Um, you know, we might start to see Rob Stark lists that, you know, don't need a direwolf or don't want a direwolf and they're putting those points elsewhere, but it's now a choice. I mean, you still have a fairly big incentive to take them because they're still a cool unit. Uh, they're still a cheap extra activation, but yeah. there is, like, you know, it's not like it's just a no brainer pick right here. Whereas previously, you know, like, okay, Rob Stark at three points where he gets me a cool, super powerful attachment and then a free activation with the direwolf, no brainer. Here, between the two of them, I am investing five points, which is the potential cost of an entire other unit. So it is something to factor in. Yeah, and I wouldn't say uh, they're just cheap they also have great value like their cost efficiency i would say is still pretty high um even at three points so um let's say that there was no restriction on rob stark like uh, on having rob stark to take the wolf then that might be even a little too much just because of how great value this unit has but the thing that michael said which i think uh nails it is that um, it starts adding up like everything has great value but when the points start adding up that means you're you, you have gaps in your list that um you need to kind of cover with other units and you might not have the points i'm i'm both excited and terrified to have a you know that disrupt disruptibility on a fast maneuvering creature that can get over to my tasty free folks so <laughs> we'll see my guys need all the help they can need, get hitting stuff so but that is something to note is that, you know, like the wolves are not going to really do anything on their own because, yeah, they can tie up a unit, but you're looking at a four plus save of four wounds. Greywind here happens to be one of the more defendable ones here because he does have that disruptibility. But at the end of the day, you're still looking at four wounds. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's still ways around this. You know, there's still counterplay here. And then finally, you know, we have the character, the, the wolf lord, Rob Stark. And, you know, he's still all about the positioning. He's got his order tactical reposition so he can have a friendly unit in short range shift, including his own unit. And then he's got regroup, so he's got a little bit of built-in healing here. What was the thought between adding on this healing component to Rob Stark? That actually came about with uh, a bit of his refocus here is that, you know, if you look at the ability there, you know, you read it and just see his commander and it's like, okay, yeah, tactical reposition is really cool. And then regroup is like, okay, that, that's a little out of left field because I'm forced into retreating. But then you have more interplay with his tactics cards where two of his three cards allow you to perform retreat actions. So he's giving it innate benefit and having synergies with his tactics cards built in uh, to give him that bigger focus. Yeah, on top of that, I'd like to say that tactical reposition is, is an ability that, in my mind, is pretty high in stock, let's say, because now this is a, basically a swift reposition on a stick, right? Mm -hmm. It's pretty impressive, and especially because mobility is the stark thing, but I'd say it, it's 
not as accessible now as it, it, it was it before. Um, this, this is pretty interesting. At the same time, what's interesting with Regroup is not only, like Michael said, it has amazing synergy with his cards, but I think it also fits the theme where Rob is the, his father's son, let's say, right? And this kind of would be fitting in, in Ned Stark as well. I'd say so it, it kind of makes sense and also if you are retreating it it usually means you're either searching for a tactical advantage or it's because you need your unit to uh, get some breath you know before they can go back in so like you might retreat and use the bags or something like that so uh, regroup really helps you in that st sense where it's cutting off a step of what you need to do when retreating fantastic and all of his cards still also about mobility um well, oops i lost my thing here sorry i closed my window uh, <clears throat> uh so and his tactics card is still all about mobility with hit and run sticking in there uh now when he when he zips away he also makes his enemy become weakened it seems also like maybe you see a move from having to be more of like a global ability to one that the kicker really is focused in on rob so kind of narrowing the the use a little bit on the kicker uh, but still being a great unit overall in the faction is that potentially at all because of how valuable being able to you know, reposition units like Berserkers, et cetera, are, are in, in, in this faction? I'd say this is more to reinforce the importance of Rob in the battlefield. Um, we kind of did this with a lot of commanders. This, Rob is definitely not a commander like Jamie, where if he's on the battlefield, he's instantly affecting his own and the enemy's army's morale and the way they're thinking. Um, he um, he was notorious for actually catching people by surprise, being so inexperienced and successful at the same time until he wasn't. I think this is just to reinforce that um, if Rob is on the battlefield, he does bring something to the table as well. Um, you'll see that there is um, a Rob kicker on another card as well. So it's it's just more in line with the 2021 updates in general, where if a commander has a certain amount of battlefield presence, that should be reflected in his cards. That's awesome. I love it. I love how you guys are working so hard to make the mechanics so good, but like always thinking to make sure that it's like flavorable as well. I think that's one of the things that makes this game stand out so much is that uh, there's so many boxes that get ticked on like all fronts, where if you're really into for the theme, you're really into for the mechanics, you know, it's got all of that. Uh, yeah, like if if you're playing just for mechanics, like why do you need the miniatures, right? <laughs> the, the flavor has to tie in with everything. I I think that a game that doesn't have a good tie in with flavor um, is won't ever be a great game. So I noticed on superior positioning, uh, we have the removal of the two dice for disorderly. And we see that on the missing, uh, we see that also on the terrain as well, that it doesn't have the, uh, you know, roll two dice now to see if you get disorderly. What was the reason behind improving that mechanic? What you actually mentioned there are just kind of two things that happen independently that kind of are coalescing in this situation. The terrain aspect was changed more so to just improve some of the reliability, but also impact that terrain has on the battlefield because we want it to be a big, important thing. And so upping its role in the kind of those little subtle ways is a, a you know a conscious effort that we did that was an independent thing to effects like this which you just remove the roll two dice and take the lowest effects mm -hmm. now a lot of the times like those there's no really formula that those fit sometimes it was you know in this case like here the uh number you have to roll was you know increased from a one to now a three or less in other cases it's automatic sometimes you know the effect was entirely removed on the two dice like there's no there's no set reason or you know algorithm to why those were changed but that's again just two separate effects that happen to deal with the same area kind of overlapping so i can see why there is comparison but they there is not an intentional design choice between those two things the outcomes just happen to have uh, turned out roughly the same well i mean this looks fantastic and, and what was really cool is that we're getting pretty far into the visions here right so we've seen the free folk right that's important we've also <laughs> seen the Baratheons. We're seeing Starks. Um, so we're getting down to, you know, Night's Watch, Lannisters. But we're kind of getting a, a much clearer picture of what's in store here with these, these larger sort of tidbits here. So I'm excited to, to see what we have on tap for next week. Hopefully it's not those dashedly Night's Watch. Maybe we'll go Lannister. We'll see. But um, I'm, I'm excited either way. And it's cool looking at these like kind of older factions, right? Both Night's Watch and Lannisters. Um, 
those are, you know, obviously one's the original launch faction, but the other one was one of the earlier releases, right? If you're not counting neutrals. So it'll be fun to see what they look like in a more uh, in-depth manner. Yeah, it's a 50-50 shot over which one's going to appear next time. I mean, those are like the best Vegas odds you're going to get if you want to put down some bets. Are you guys rooting for different factions here? Is it like Team Fabio, Team Michael? Who's the, uh, after that dodgeball match last time? Oof, I don't know. who. <laughs> yeah, um, I, after that dodgeball match, uh, I got updated to my, my next version. I'm now Fabio 7.0. <laughs> we, might have to, we might have to have some sort of challenge in the, uh, in the, in the next one here. We'll see. We'll see. But I'm excited. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming on. And uh, we're looking forward to what the future holds. Thank you for having us. And in the meantime, we hope we get your miniatures on the table.